OK, so welcome. Um, thanks for coming. Um, this is a huge, big room. <laughs> but um, it's good to see uh, quite a few of you here. Uh, my name is Will Abson. Um, I'm a integrations engineer. I work with an Alfresco engineering. Um, and I also run a project called Share Extras. Uh, now, Share Extras has about 30 different add-ons for Alfresco Share, as the name implies. Um, I apologize to Gab in advance, who I'm just following up, um, because none of my code examples are yet using Maven. <laughs> I'm going to do some technical examples that involve an, an, a basic and build script, um, but we'll walk through those um, when the time comes. In the meantime, I want to uh, go through some, some introductory slides here. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, I think one of the things that uh, has been interesting for me working with Jeff and the wider community over the last couple of years has been the Dashlet Challenge. Uh, we've had a huge, wide range of different types of entries in both this year and last year, and I was fortunate enough uh, for Jeff to invite me to be a judge um, as part of that process. So I've seen quite a lot of shared Dashlets um, over my time at Alfresco, as well as the ones that um, I myself and the other contributors um, in ShareRectors have built. So I'm going to use some of these as examples of good practice um, in these first few slides here. Um, but before we jump into that, um, I'm just going to introduce the, um, the purpose of today's presentation. So um, everyone knows what a dashlet is, but we want to build something um, that's actually practical, that's actually useful. Um, so this picture here, I, I'm going to give away um, my, um, my geek credentials um, as a railway geek as well as a JavaScript geek. I'm not sure quite which one is more embarrassing. Um, but anyway, that is a, um, a steam locomotive um, called Planet. It was one of the first. It's a, it's a reproduction of one of the first um, trains that ran in the United Kingdom. Uh, everyone knows the United Kingdom invented railways. Um, so that was pretty much the first uh, railway train in the world um, to, uh, to go into commercial uh, service for passengers. Um, but it was pretty basic. We can do a lot better these days. Um, so I think when we're aiming to produce customizations, we want to be doing something that's a little bit more modern. Um, we're pushing the boundaries of the frameworks. Um, and so I want to show you today a few tips and tricks um, for what we can do, um, how we can build on different types um, of widgets um, and buttons and things like that into our dashlets that we build and share. Um, now, the title of this talk is Developing Great Dashlets. Um, so we should define what we mean by great dashlet first off. Now, obviously, a dashlet needs to convey um, useful information, and it, that information needs to be meaningful to users who are using the share application. Dashlets should be flexible to some degree. Most of the dashlets that come out of the box with Alfresco can be configured in some way, um, perhaps directly by the user or by the site administrator. And the user interface should respond to that configuration and the context in which the dashlet is being used. And we want the dashlet to look good. We want it to be rich, to have a good UI. So those are the things we're going to try and do today. Um, now, I mentioned the dashlet challenge entries that we had this year. I just want to highlight a few of them here. Um, these weren't necessarily the winning dashlets, but in terms of the talk that I'm doing today, I thought it was worth just picking a few examples out here. Um, we had a mix of dashlets. Um, some dashlets took data from the repository. Um, this is one example. It's loading data from the repository. It's displaying that in list format with paging, with custom filters along the top of the main view there um, on that screenshot on the left. We've also got dialogues for adding uh, new types of data into the repository. You can do that directly from the dashlet. Um, so this is the sort of thing that if you're developing practical dashlets, you'll need to understand how to do. Um, this is another example, slightly simpler UI, um, but I thought this um, was a really good example where they've used uh, some of the basic uh, share look and feels and extended uh, those, um, uh, those styles, those classes that are available out of the box. 
And lastly, um, this is an example um, of a dashlet that pulls data from the Alfresco repository, but not from a site specifically. Um, so this is pulling information from a different data source, uh, from, a web, from a web script that's actually sitting on the Alfresco repository, and displaying a graph view. Um, and I liked that because it's slightly unconventional, and it's also using a really nice uh, graphing library to display that. Um, so that we can implement dashlets in different ways. So now we've got a basic idea of the, the, the variety of dashlets that you know, we might want to build. Um, I want to start looking at some examples. Now, I'm going to start off with a basic Hello World dashlet. Uh, that dashlet is actually part of Share Extras. Um, I've actually updated it for version 4.2. Um, if, if you guys were here for, um, for David's talk um, just before lunch, you'll have seen some of the changes that we've introduced in um, in version 4.2. So the code that you're going to see here is fully compatible with 4.2, and it's using those new markup directives, for example, uh, to bring in dependencies into our dashlet. So we'll go through that. Um, so that's the dashlet itself, and we're going to build that up to add these different types of controls here, uh, different types of UI components, um, using different services from the repository and from Share itself. Um, so we'll step through those in eight different stages here. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, some of this code actually working, hopefully, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. There are also in this slide deck some additional examples um, that leverage some blog posts that Jeff, uh, that Jeff Potts wrote earlier this year. Um, they provide some supplemental examples um, that we probably won't have time to look at today, but it is in the slides, and it does reference uh, another uh, code example that's also provided um, as part of uh, this talk. Now, the example projects that we're going to, we're going through here, um, I mentioned uh, what the dashlet does. It starts off very basic, we could build it up. Um, now, the way I've managed this is I've created a, a GitHub project. I've actually cloned that project to my laptop here. Um, and I've got a different branch for each of the eight stages um, of, the, um, of the talk here where we show adding different types of controls. Um, that means that if you go to that site, you can, uh, you can switch to any of the different branches that I'll be showing today. Uh, you can pull that down and you can try out the code yourself. Uh, you can pull down one branch, try building that, pull down the next branch. Um, and Git makes it quite easy to do that. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate by deploying this into a local repository when we get to that stage. And I've got a local Tomcat running on my laptop here that I'll show that using. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we're going to start with a very basic dashlet. Um, it's got a few files that make it up. It's really just a single web script. There's nothing more than that. Um, but obviously, it, it's a web tier web script. It's not sitting in the repository. Uh, and it implements the Dashlet user interface by supplying some HTML. Um, it doesn't really do much more than that. It, 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 it's sort of semi-dynamic. Um, but it doesn't really fetch any data from the repository. It doesn't really do anything fancy here. Um, and that's all it does. Um, so we've just got a title, we've got a body, and that's it. You can't really do anything with it. It just sits there on the dashboard, and that's that. Um, so that's the first stage of the dashlet, and this is where we're starting from here. So we're going to build this up, and we're going to add some more exciting capabilities to this dashlet. Um, just to understand the code before we go into that, this is the free marker code um, that's implementing that user interface. Uh, so. If you've used, if you've extended uh, share in 4.2, you'll recognize this is now being the standard boilerplate um, that we're using. It's not too different from the 4.0 style um, and, the, and the earlier 3.x style, um, but we do have some, um, some specific free marker directives around that just wrap the markup there. Other than that, the markup will be pretty similar for any version of share. Um, so that's the free marker. Um, specifically, that's the, um, the fourth file on the list there. But the dashlet is actually made up of a few other files. Um, I'm not going to go into each one of those in detail, but you can look at each one of those in the code itself um, when you come to download that. 
And as you can see, it's got a controller, um, a JavaScript controller there that get.js file, but that's not really doing much. So we're going to extend that. We're going to extend the free marker file, um, and we're going to add some additional files um, that this dashlet also uses to do some more rich stuff. So the first thing I want to do um, is if we look back at that screenshot that I had up there, you see there's a lot of white space on that dashlet. So the first thing we probably want to do um, is allow people to resize that dashlet so they can make it a bit smaller if they want to on the dashboard. Um, so this is something that if it's on a user dashboard, the user could do. Um, a site manager could do it on a site dashboard. Um, There we go. Um, and we're going to make that, that resizing persistent. So this is automatically done by the resizer widgets uh, that's provided by Share. Um, the height attribute is actually stored within the components. Um, essentially, it gets stored within the repository. That's handled by Surf. We don't need to worry about that too much. But it will remember uh, the height of the dashlet when we've resized that. Now, to implement that in our dashlet, uh, we need to use some client-side JavaScript to add that dynamic capability. Um, now, to do that, we need to create an instance within our page of this JavaScript object here. So if I was to do a view source um, of the shared dashboard uh, HTML, I would see quite a few of, instance, of, of those um, instances of that dashlet resizer object. Um, and you'll have one for each dashlet um, that's resizable. So what I'm going to do in my dashlet here is I'm going to create an instance of that in the HTML. Um, now, before 4.2, um, we, um, we actually do that uh, manually in the HTML. And if you look at the, um, the HTML free marker, that I just showed you in the basic example, you'll see uh, some JavaScript code in a script tag that does that. Um, we use a slightly different mechanism in 4.2. Um, so this is JavaScript code here, which you'll recognize. Uh, but this isn't happening on the, um, this isn't being executed um, in the web browser. This is executing in the web script. So if you look, you'll see this. Uh, we're in this config alfresco site web scripts directory. So this is the controller from the, um, from the web scripts. Um, it's implemented in JavaScript. And we have this object called widgets. And we say that we want to create um, this, this widget here. Um, the type is alfresco widget dashlet resizer. And we need to provide some arguments to this. Um, those arguments are pre-supplied to the web scripts. You don't need to worry about where they come from. But they essentially, they uniquely identify um, the HTML element that the dashlet is sitting in so that, the, um, so that the JavaScript on the page can resize it physically. And they also provide the unique ID of the instance where we're going to store that height attribute in the repository. Um, essentially, you don't need to worry about that. Um, you just need to make sure that you're providing this boilerplate code within your web scripts, JavaScript controller there. Um, so then what happens is in the web scripts, um, this will get pushed through to the free marker file, and it will render that. Um, so we can look at that in a bit more detail in Eclipse in a minute. Um, I'm going to skip back and um, look at another type, another type of widget here. Um, so the second type of widget that we might want to add to our dashlet um, are these things called title bar actions. You'll recognize these if you've used uh, share version 4 um, or 4.2, or 4.0 or 4.2. Um, it's there in both. Um, and they provide little icons there. You can see a small screenshot on the top right there. Um, so pretty much every dashlet will provide that little help action uh, that you can click on. It'll display a little bubble. Um, and it'll give you some more information about what that dashlet does and how to use it. Um, previously, those, um, 
those actions might have been placed in a toolbar um, within the Dashlet UI, and that would sit underneath the title bar. It took up a lot of vertical space, and it wasn't really required. Um, so they now appear in the title bar um, area now in, um, in version 4. Um, the action that you get when clicking on one of those icons, um, it could be a link um, in either the same window or a new window or tab. Um, but usually, we use some JavaScript to implement that behavior. Um, now, similar to the, um, the resizer, we've got a, Share provides a standard widget um, for creating that, for setting up that behavior within the title bar there. Um, the name of this widget, uh, which again, you need one of these per dashlet, um, is Alfresco widget dash bar title bar actions. Um, you saw in the, um, in the slide for the resizer, and also here I'm providing the URL of some API documentation. If you want to know more about that object, you can look at uh, the full, um, the full f list of functions, properties that are available on that object um, by looking at that JS doc there that's referenced. So you'll, you'll see a few of these links in the slides. Um, so again, very similar to the previous example. Um, we've got our JavaScript controller here for the web script. Um, we've got this widget, um, this widgets uh, object here. It's actually an array. Um, now, there's two things we want to do here. Just look at the um, the bit down there on line 29, um, and you're seeing again, like we were in the previous example, we're adding this widget. Uh, it's a dashlet title bar actions widget um, to that array there. Um, but before we do that, we're actually putting together a, a separate list of actions. Um, so here, what I'm doing is I'm just pushing one value into that actions array. And that's going to implement a help button on the page. So there's just going to be one action that will render a question mark in the title bar when I hover over it. When I click on it, it should give me some text. And you can see the parameters there being provided. Um, that message.get function will actually go uh, to the dot .properties file from the web strips and return the text that's listed for, that, for those two labels there. Uh, so we can add a French translation or a Spanish translation or whatever as we need to. Um, so this is very similar to the last example. Slightly more complex because before we put that widget into uh, into the list, we've actually got to set up the list of actions that we want. With the resizer, it was, it was a little bit easier. We didn't have that extra parameter that we had to set. We just say, we're giving you a resizer. Um, and then if you look at the last line there, um, that last line is significant um, because if you've, if you've done a lot of web scripts work before, you'll know that that is putting that widgets object um, into the in-memory model that's passed over to the free marker template. Um, so the free marker template can then take this information and render it in an appropriate way. Now, this is another slight change in 4.2 um, that's worth noting. So the widgets here. Um, if you looked in the free marker template in version 4, you'd see, uh, as I mentioned, the scripts tag uh, in HTML um, and the actual JavaScript code within that that set up the instances of those two widgets. Um, but in 4.2, uh, we have a page direct, a free marker directive there uh, that will create the JavaScript code automatically for those. So we don't need to worry about creating that ourselves. Because we've uh, passed in that, that widgets object in our model, um, we just need to make sure this bit of free marker is in our uh, HTML.FTL template, and that will get rendered onto the page when necessary. OK. So dashlet resizes we've covered. Um, we've covered the title bar actions. Uh, and that was examples two and three there. 
Now, so far we've looked at adding this, this dynamic JavaScript behavior to the Dashless, um, but we've, we haven't implemented any specific extra code ourselves. So we've used these widgets that are provided by Share. We use the resizer, we use the title bar actions. Um, if we want to go further than that, we need to start thinking about implementing um, our own components. So this would, is basically another widget, but we need to declare a custom widget ourselves that can take care of that dash alert, and maybe needs to do some dynamic rendering of text. Um, if we want to refresh the UI every so often, maybe reload data from the server, we're going to need some JavaScript behaviors to do that. So we can get that by implementing our own um, client-side widget or component. Um, now, Alfresco, as I mentioned, it provides those widget classes, as I mentioned. It also provides a base class that we can use. It's called Alfresco Component Base. Um, I won't go into the technical details of what that does, but effectively, it allows us to easily set up a custom JavaScript object and bind that to a particular dashlet in this instance. Um, so we're going to create um, a, a new JavaScript class here. Um, and that class will extend Alfresco component base. Um, by doing that, we'll be, we'll be able to easily set that up and add it to the page um, to add our own custom JavaScript behaviors. Um, the class, the JavaScript class that we're going to declare, um, is going to be declared in a client-side JavaScript file. So we're not going to declare that in the web script file itself. So we need to add um, a client-side JavaScript file and we're going to need to suck that in uh, to the page so that it gets included via uh, a script tag, um, and the browser loads it, and then it can run on the page when necessary. So we're going to need to do a few, more, a few things here. So this is the fourth example that we're going to look at. Now, I'll start again with the web scripts, the web script files themselves. Uh, again, we've got the JavaScript controller. We've got this widget object. We're now pushing in a third object into this. Um, now here, we're not using an Alfresco class. We're using our own class there. And I've just used this example um, where I've used the namespace of my company dot dash dot dot hello world. Um, if you look at the Alfresco examples um, of the, where it's providing dashlets, um, that would be Alfresco. Um, but usually, when you're implementing your own classes here, you'd use your own namespace there. So uh, this is this my company dash let hello world is the JavaScript class we're going to implement, and we can pass some options over to it um, as well that can be used to configure the behavior um, of this dashlet. And that's all we're really doing. Then in the free marker part of the dashlet. Um, we still have the widgets directive um, that sets up that JavaScript on the page when the HTML is rendered. Um, I haven't shown that here, but it is still there um, in the free marker. But what occurs before that, um, starting on line one, is we've added these markup directives. So Dave talked about that earlier. Um, and these markup directives allow us to inject HTML into the page into specific areas that are marked. Um, ready to receive that. So the areas that we're targeting here are the CSS and JavaScript markup areas. Uh, and we're putting in our CSS and JavaScript dependencies. So I mentioned the client-side JavaScript that we need to get included in the page. Um, but we've probably got some CSS as well to, um, to set up the look and feel of the dashless. Um, so I've added that in there as well. But maybe you won't have that. You can, might just have a JavaScript file um, that defines your class. Now, this is the third file. Um, and this is a new file here. So if you look at the path here, you see that uh, this isn't under site web scripts. Um, this is in the directory uh, within our project called source web. Um, and you see the path there is some co components dashless hello world.js. Uh, that should match what we reference there um, in that bottom line where we specify the source attribute for the scripts tag. Um, 
When we package up our customizations, it will put it into a jar that we can deploy into Share, or it could be an AMP, um, and all of these will be available through that URL. Um, so we can pull that JavaScript file into Share, but obviously we need to declare the JavaScript in there that defines our class. So this is how we do that. Um, I've skipped a little bit at the start, so we actually need to, uh, to, to check if the my company object um, has been set up. That's just a namespace. Um, again, if you look at the code in detail, you'll see that. Um, but I want to get to the meat of this here. So in order to set up a custom class in JavaScript, um, we follow a standard pattern. First, we declare a constructor. Um, I mentioned that uh, these client-side components that we're defining all will usually extend this class called our Fresco component base. Now, that itself has a constructor. So all we're doing here is we're simply, we're simply linking through. We're calling the superclasses constructor, much as you would do in Java if you're extending a Java class. But this is just a little bit different um, in JavaScript here. But the effect will be the same. Uh, then we use yahoo.extend, which Dave mentioned again earlier. Um, but it allows us to add um, additional functions and properties onto this class here. So here we've defined the constructor. And then in the second part, we're defining first this property called, called options. Um, if you remember, um, when I, I'll just go back a minute. Um, in the web script here, we were sending this, op this options object over. And we are sending a, um, a name, a value pair over. Um, when that gets sent through to the dash alert, um, it will actually arrive in that options, um, in that options object there. Well, that's just an empty object for now. But we can extend that out later. Um, so the options can be used to customize the behavior of the dash alert. And then we've got a function called onReady. Now, onReady is the one thing that you need above anything, um, because onReady is where the, the actual work happens. Um, so onReady will make sure that the, the page HTML is loaded, or at least that area where the data is included. And then you can start actually doing some useful work there. So we can look at some examples that, um, that go through the sorts of things that we can do here now. But this is our basic structure. Okay. So I was going to do a demo at the end, but I think um, let's check how we're doing for time. So we're about halfway through at the moment. So I think now might be a good time just to show uh, how I've been setting up some of this code here. Um, so we've we've had four different stages of the examples so far. We started off very basic, um, and then we, we first extended the web scripts to add these custom widgets. And then we've added our own custom client-side widget here. So we've got some client-side files now as well. OK. Now, all the way through, I've been referencing uh, these different files that we've been looking at in the slides. So if you download the source code and import it into Eclipse, this is what you'll see. Um, so you see we've got a config directory here. This is where our web script lives. And those are the, those are the dashlet files that I mentioned. So we've got a HTML file, a HTML template. If I just extend that out a bit. Um, we've got a JavaScript controller. Um, that's not really doing much at the moment. Um, so this is the stage one example. So this has no dynamic capabilities whatsoever. Um, it's not defining any widgets at all. Um, if we look in the HTML, it's exactly the HTML we saw in that first example. Um, so it's very, very basic. We do have a source directory and a web directory within that. Now, that's ready to receive our client-side files. So you can use this as a skeleton project for your initial dashlets, if you like. 
Um, now, if I switch to the next part of the example here, I switch to example two. So you see, again, we've got this source web directory. We haven't got any client-side files in here yet, because we didn't do that until example four. Um, but in the free marker template, uh, we have got uh, this widgets, uh, this create widgets directive here. Um, so that will set up um, any widgets that we've specified in the controller JavaScript. And this is the controller JavaScript. So you see we've got uh, the really basic code that we had before that's just doing some, um, um, some fairly static stuff. But then the interesting stuff is happening here where we're adding um, this title bar actions widget. And again, you saw that I added one action uh, to there in this first part. And then I add those actions to the widget. And I send the widget through to the free marker in this model.widgets object. So that's pretty basic. I've got this uh, deployed in a local Tomcat instance, as I mentioned. And I've got a sample site here. And I can add the hello world uh, dashlet in there. Just put it at the top. So that's the static example. You see, there's no resize, there's no nothing. So that was the code as I deployed it before I started. Yeah? Ah, yeah. Um, so Dave's just pointed out this. Um, one of the files I didn't go into here. Um, I guess I'm assuming a sort of basic knowledge of dashlets, but maybe everyone doesn't have that. Um, so the way that the dashlet appeared in that list was through declaring this dashlet family in its descriptor here. Um, so this file is going to be unchanged throughout the, throughout the examples, but just understand that's how it's appearing there. Thank you. Um, so I just switched to this example too. Um, I've got an ant build script here. Um, and now I've switched to example two. I want to uh, show you what the code is going to look like there. Um, so I'm going to run that. What this build script does is it copies the files over into Tomcat, and it calls the refresh web scripts uh, script that's provided by Share. Um, so that means that when I go into Chrome and I hit refresh, you'll see that we've now got this title bar actions area here. And we've got some text when we click that uh, button there. So that's the title bar actions. I'll switch to example three. OK. I can also do this from the command line. I just refresh Eclipse. There we go. We've now got a resizer there as well. If I refresh the page, that's all stored. So we haven't done anything special to get that. We've, we've reused these widgets that come with share. And switch to number four. OK. 
Okay. So now if you notice, we've got some files in our source web directory. We've got a CSS file. I won't go into that. It's basically empty right now. Um, and then we've got this uh, client-side JavaScript file. The lines that I skipped in the slide are these ones here where we're just defining our namespace. And then we have the constructor for the dashlet. And then after that, we extend the base class and we add these options and on ready. So we haven't done anything here. Um, this dashlet component isn't doing any real work, but it is setting itself up on the page. And the reason it's doing that is because we added it to the widgets here. So we've now got three widgets on the page. Uh, one does nothing, which is our custom one, but we've got a dashlet resize in the title bar actions. OK. Um, so now we want to actually do some, add some real controls um, to our dashlet. Um, the most common thing to add to a dashlet is buttons. Um, which may be clickable, they may do some work. Um, behind the scenes, you may want to go off to the repository, get some data when someone clicks the button. Um, as Dave mentioned, we use UE2 um, for share, and UE2 provides a wide range of buttons. They're all documented um, on their developer site there. We also provide some wrapper functions that allow you to very easily create those buttons without having to call UE direct. Um, so, the precise function that we provide is called alfresco util create ue button. And we just need to provide a few simple parameters to that, um, as well as declaring some HTML for the button itself. Um, as you might have guessed, the HTML gets declared in our dashlet free marker file. And then this code, where we call alfresco util create ue button, will be provided um, in the on ready method of our client side component that we looked at. If you want to know uh, more about this function, you can see it's documented there. At the bottom, you can go and take a look at that. Another thing we might want to do, um, perhaps when someone clicks the button, is you might want to go in and, um, and manipulate the, um, the page itself through the DOM. So we can do this directly via the browser, but um, one of the really useful things that uh, YUI does, or UE, is it provides us with wrapper functions uh, that provide a standardized user interf standardized interface to do that, no matter what browser we're using. Um, so you'll see a lot of Yahoo Util.dom used um, in Alfresco Share, uh, or perhaps just DOM, which is often used as a shortcut for that. Um, those are some common, um, some common functions that are used. Um, and I'd say the most common out, out of those three um, is yahoo util.dom.get. That gets a HTML element by a unique ID. And once we've got that, we can do some of this cool stuff here um, that's just standard um, DOM based actions. Um, so this is the fifth example here. Um, First, we've got the free marker file. In the free marker file, we're adding a button. We're actually wrapping that in a div, but the div doesn't really do anything. It's just going to um, give us a bit of padding around the button, that's all. Then we've got our client side components, our client side JavaScript. We've now got something in our on ready method. So this is the first time we've actually had our own custom client side components doing some real work. Uh, we're using uh, Alfresco Util Create UE Button. We're referencing the button HTML via a unique ID, which is this test button. Um, you can see it's actually got a, a custom stem as well, and that's so that if we have multiple dashlets of the same type on the page, that their IDs won't clash, and that ID gets generated automatically by the Dashlet framework. So we don't need to worry about that. We just need to make sure that that's there in our, um, in our free marker. I haven't showed where I'm actually getting that variable L from, but if you look at the free marker code, you'll see that. Um, 
So we provide a unique ID, which is this test button. We must also provide a handler. In this case, it's a click handler. Um, and this is a function that we're declaring alongside the onReady method. So this is a custom function um, on our object prototype for this custom class. And then what we're doing is we're going to get this DOM element. Um, that was actually the, the, it provided the text of the dash alert, um, and that was static text. So we can change that text when someone clicks the button uh, using these DOM methods here. And I'm also adding a custom class um, that's going to make the text look a little different. Um, so that's a basic example of adding a button. Um, that's quite a trivial example. Um, in a more real-life dashlet, um, we might want to add uh, we might add some choices for the user. So a common way of doing that is in dashlet toolbars. Um, and those dashlet toolbars can provide uh, drop-down filters. Uh, there's two examples there that I've provided um, on the top there of what you might get in a toolbar. So the first one provides an example filter. The second one provides an example action. Um, for filters, um, they're actually UE buttons as well. It just so happens that they, when you click them, they select it, they give you a drop-down um, rather than a single click handler. So again, we can use create UE button to create that. Um, we can use yahoo.util.event um, to add a click listener um, for any uh, single action uh, links that we've got um, in the toolbar there. So we're doing that for um, a custom link that we've got, and we want to add a listener to that so that when someone clicks on the link, um, they, something happens. So we can show that. Um, that's implemented in Alfresco um, in example six there. So we've got this uh, additional markup that we've got in our HTML template. Um, so we're implementing a button there through, uh, through this select tag. And we've also got um, an actual button control there. Uh, so those two implement the drop-down control. And then we've also got um, an anchor or HTML link. All of these have unique IDs. Um, and those unique IDs will be referenced in the JavaScript code, the client-side JavaScript code that sets those up. So that's a basic example of adding um, a filter there. And we've also got some function handlers there that are provided. So I won't go into those in detail. They essentially implement the behaviors uh, that are going to occur when we click on that dropdown or that link. Um, now, the thing with filters um, is normally when you see filters in dashlets and Alfresco share, you want to remember the last filter that the user had selected if they refresh the page or navigate away and come back. Now, we can do this using user preferences. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this. Um, I think we're a bit short of time. Um, but um, the preferences are implemented using what we call a standard service in Alfresco. And the services in Alfresco share um, are responsible for going off to the repository, getting some data, and then doing some work um, using that data. So in the case of these preferences, um, we're going to get some user-specific data. Um, so these preferences can be unique for each user, and it will remember those details. Um, so we're going to reference this Alfresco service preferences in our client-side uh, code here. We're not, we don't need to change the FreeMarker HTML, um, but we are going to uh, use this preference service, and we're going to reference that in our constructor. Then, in the onReady method, uh, we need to initialize those preferences. We're doing that in a custom function here. We're just deferring. But that code could equally come at the end of onReady. Um, and we're referencing the button instance, the drop-down instance that's implementing our custom filter here. We also then need to provide a handler for when the user changes the filter. Um, so we're providing that um, in this second function here. The last thing I want to 
show here, I'll show this in a second, um, is using notifications and prompts. So this could be used to display a quick prompt to the user that goes away again. Uh, you see these quite frequently in Share. For instance, when a site is created, it'll give you a very quick prompt, which flashes up, flashes away again. Um, you can also have user prompts that users have to click. So it could be an OK button, could be OK and cancel, could be yes and no. You can customize that. Um, and that's implemented using this util class um, called Alfresco Util Pop-Up Manager. Um, so we're going to use that class. Um, I'm just going to jump to Eclipse to show you this very quickly, because we are a bit short of time. I think I had another. Okay. Again, I'm going to call my and build strip just to deploy this over. Um, I definitely say it's worth looking at the code um, for this, the JavaScript code in the full context of the files. You can do that using the, um, the links that are provided on each of the slides, which are actually hyperlinks that link through to the pages on GitHub. Um, so wrapping up uh, what I've shown, uh, or what we've talked about, um, here. We've added um, a custom drop down here. Um, this has two items in it um, that I can choose between. Um, and we've got an action there that's triggered there when I click on one of those. So that's just displaying uh, what I've selected to the user. Very simple example, but you can see how you could extend this yourself to actually trigger some more advanced behavior, such as loading some custom data from the repository. Um, I also showed a more basic button. Uh, with a single click handler. Um, so if I click on that, we're just displaying a window alert. Not very elegant, but again, you could extend that. Um, and we've got a second link here in the toolbar, um, and we're displaying a user prompt there. So you can see how we went from a very basic dash alert um, that didn't really do anything at all to, first off, using some widgets on the page that are supplied by Alfresco to add title bar actions and resizes. And then within the dashlet itself, within the dashlet body um, and the dashlet toolbar that we've added, we've now added some much richer capabilities using UE, um, using some of the classes, utility methods that are provided by Share. Um, and I think the only things that we haven't really done, we haven't really loaded any real life data from the repository, like lists of documents, and we haven't had a configuration dialog. So those are the second two examples that are available as the supplemental slides and the second project that's, um, that's in the code project on GitHub. So if you want to know uh, those bits, it's definitely worth checking those out on GitHub. Um, I've also got some office hours just after this session. We've got, there's a short break now. Um, and then I'm actually going to be outside the room there. Um, so I don't know how we're doing for time on questions. <laughs> so what I would say, uh, based on Peter's response, if you have questions, come and see me in five minutes. I'll be stood right outside the room there. Um, and I'll be there for, I think, about an hour or so, um, hour and a half. Uh, the session um, is going to last for. Um, if I'm not there, then um, there should be a, a moderator there. Um, if you come a bit later on, and they should know where I am. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. And go have a look at the code. And uh, good luck with your dashlets. <laughs>